But if you're able, and join in with our call to worship based on Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. For he is the creator and sustainer of the world. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Those whose deeds and motives are pure. Those who are truthful and keep their promises. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your presence, O Lord our God. Lift up your heads, you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Kindly remain standing for our opening hymn, and you can sing heartily through your masks for holy, holy, holy. Please be seated. Let us pray. God of the ages, we praise you for all your servants who have done justice, loved mercy, and walked humbly with you. We praise you for all those of every time and place who in life and death have witnessed to your truth and love. We praise you for those who showed compassion to the least, feeding the hungry and clothing the naked, welcoming the stranger and offering mercy and forgiveness to those who have lost their way. We praise you for those who were willing to lose their lives in service to others, caring for the sick, comforting the dying, visiting the lonely, consoling those in grief. We praise you for those who brought us to faith in you, influenced our lives for good, and inspired and encouraged us on our journey. For parents, 
Sunday school teachers, ministers, authors, church leaders, and others known to us, for all the saints who from their labors rest, we praise and thank you. Bless this time of worship and prayer. God of goodness and purpose, in you we live and move and have our being. You are the fountain of life and you refresh us. You are the light of the world and you show us the way. You are the spirit of life and you move in us each new day. So we join our voices with angels and archangels, with the saints and disciples of every time and place to worship you as creator, redeemer, and the source of our hope and our joy. Praise be to you, God most holy, ever three and ever one, world without end. Amen. And let us now continue with a prayer of confession. God of goodness and mercy, we confess that we have often been caught up in the ways of the world. At times we have been indifferent to your will, staying silent when we should have spoken up for justice. We have heard your call to put our faith into action, but fear and distractions take their hold. Forgive us. Call us back to your way of life, a way of love, commitment, respect, and grace. Call us back to a way of life that honors you and creation and guides us to better love our neighbors as ourselves. Give us courage and commitment to serve you as saints in this time and this place, whatever the challenges may be. This we ask in the authority of our Savior, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Know that we are forgiven by God's great mercy and have the grace to forgive each other just as we ourselves have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. I invite you to take the bulletin home with you. There's just two brief announcements. Obviously, coffee hour continues after the service. Uh, for those who have already shown their vaccine passports to Marg at the foot of the stairs, the door is open. <laughs> the door is open to others too once they show their passports. Uh, the second proof of the second vaccination and uh, do stay behind and enjoy that time together. And just a reminder that there is no uh, Bible study group this week. We will be meeting the following week. And now we come for the time of our next hymn, for which you will remain seated and you're welcome to sing along with God is love, come heaven adoring.
Let us pray. God of the prophets and poets, the seers and the storytellers of Scripture, we are grateful for the ancient visions of your truth which still guides us. We give thanks for all who have received your vision and shaped diverse and faithful communities to follow in your way. Continue to open that vision to us that by your Holy Spirit we may become transformed by the renewing of your living word in our hearts. May your spirit this day open our minds and hearts to the words that you have for us in our times. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I now invite Mary to come and read our scriptures for us this morning. Good morning. We have three readings today. The first is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 to 9, uh, taken from the NIV. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich foods for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. The second reading is taken from John, chapter 11, verses 17 to 27, also from the NIV today. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And the last reading this morning is from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 7, and again from the NIV. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. 
And this concludes this morning's reading. Thank you, Mary. And now, again, we remain seated for our next hymn, For All the Saints. Well, as I'm sure you all know, Halloween is a contraction of All Hallows' Eve. And Hallows is an archaic term for saints or holy persons. Consequently, tomorrow is All Hallows' Day, better known as All Saints' Day, and the following day is All Souls' Day. And on these two days, Christians of various traditions and nationalities celebrate those who have died in the faith. I have to say this is not a a very big deal for me personally, but I respect those for whom it's very important. And whether we're talking about the Christian martyrs or those known personally to us who have died, it's no bad thing to pause and to honor their memory and to give thanks to God for their lives. And underlining these special days is the belief that there's a powerful spiritual bond between those deemed to be in the presence of God and with ourselves, whether they be famous or not. After all, in the great prayer of thanksgiving that is part of our liturgy for Holy Communion, we proclaim, therefore, with apostles and prophets and that great cloud of witnesses, who live for you beyond all time and space, we lift our hearts in joyful praise. Now, to be fair, the New Testament is not consistent as to precisely what happens when we die. Nevertheless, many find it comforting to think that those who have died are somehow cheering us on in our way. You know, it's all too easy for preachers to paint half the big picture of the biblical story. The one that begins with creation and ends with the story of the spread of the early church from Jerusalem to Rome 
following on from the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. We often underemphasize the great Christian hope of Christ's coming again on that great day of the Lord, when God's justice will finally put the world to right. That powerful resurrection hope is something foreign to most Old Testament writers, although there are bold hints here and there. For example, our reading from Isaiah 25, there is a magnificent and shocking vision of God having a banquet for all the nations, not just Jews, in Jerusalem and with the best of meats and the finest of wines. And at that time, Isaiah says that God will swallow up death forever and will wipe away the tears from all faces. And in that day, Isaiah says the nations will proclaim, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. Let us rejoice and be glad in the Lord's salvation. I suggest we must not lose sight of this whole biblical picture from beginning to end. And speaking of ends, John the seer has a vision of a new heaven and a new earth. And they echo Isaiah's themes. Revelation 21 is part of the pinnacle of John's apocalyptic vision. And as long as we understand that John's overall message is much broader than the seven verses that were read to us this morning, we can still explore them briefly together and therefore be inspired and reassured. Remember, this is a vision. And just as human imagination is incapable of perceiving, so John knows that human language is capable or incapable of expressing the reality of things in the world as they truly are. In other words, in the way that God sees them. Yet rather than being paralyzed in awe and stunned into silence, John endeavors to portray what he sees in a variety of this worldly pictures. We should therefore not take his descriptions too literally. John is painting an impressionistic canvas and alludes to Old Testament images of which his audience would be very familiar. And what he sees is a new heaven and a new earth, one in which there is no sea. Clearly, this is not a place of disembodied spirits in the presence of God. Rather, the creator God, who in Genesis 1 made the sea, land, and the sky, is going to make something new. But oddly to our ears, this creation has no sea, which might sound remarkably dull and boring. But in the Old Testament, the turbulent sea itself often symbolized chaos and evil. And not just the sea monster Leviathan that I mentioned recently in the story of Job. In the new creation, there is no capability for such things. The threat of chaos has been removed forever. And when we think of natural disasters like earthquakes, storms, floods and famines, and of de disease, decay and death, all these are features of the sea. And we are told they will not be present in the new creation. That's wonderful news. Life will be fulfilled, joyful and vibrant. And that's why John goes on to say, God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. But there's much more. John says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among his people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them 
and be their God. Note John's language. We don't go up, as it were. God comes down. Put differently, God will come from his dimension into ours. What John glimpsed was a new holy city, not made by human hands, but by God himself. Moreover, God will no longer be hidden. He will live among mortals. And that's why in this new Jerusalem there is no temple or churches. There will be no need for such buildings because God will be present everywhere and intimately accessible to all his people. In the vision, John then hears the powerful voice of God, that same voice of God that spoke in Genesis 1, bringing creation itself into being. And God says, I am making everything new. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. With that vivid picture in mind, let's briefly consider the pivotal aspect of the story of the raising of Lazarus. <clears throat> You'll remember that Lazarus had been dead for four days, and naturally his sisters Mary and Martha were disappointed that Jesus hadn't come earlier. Nevertheless, Martha says to Jesus, I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus replies, your brother will rise again. To which Martha responds, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha then was one of those Jews who believed in the general resurrection of the dead at the culmination of history on the great day of the Lord. But she could not really have understood what that might mean. No more than any other disciple could have understood before Jesus had raised, risen from the dead. But what Jesus says next is stunning. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives in, by believing in me will never die. Profound and jaw-dropping as those words are, both then and now, on their own, they mean very little. The act of raising Lazarus from the dead is then a sign that supports that bold claim of Jesus. But what does it all mean? Earlier in John's Gospel, after Jesus heals on the Sabbath, the religious Leaders are very critical of Jesus, and he defends himself, saying, My father is still working, and I also am working. What does that mean? After all, in Genesis, we're told that God rested on the Sabbath. Now, Jesus really isn't contracting, contradicting the supposed words of Moses since Jewish thinkers had come to understand that God cannot rest on the Sabbath because creation continues. Children are born, and so new life is being given, and people die and therefore need to be judged. The work of God never stops. And Jesus says that like his father, he too is working to bring about new life, or healing in that case, even on the Sabbath. And then Jesus says, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whoever he wishes. Very truly I tell you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Jesus is therefore claiming that he has been entrusted with the fullness of the Father's authority to both give life and to judge. Those two tasks that Jewish scholars agreed that God does 
even on the Sabbath. John is therefore telling his readers that that's the kind of authority that God the Father has given to the Son. And we take note of that, particularly with reference to the final resurrection. And so now let's quickly turn back again to the story of Lazarus and hear those words of Jesus, I am the resurrection of the life. Raising the raising of Lazarus back to life is John's way of further demonstrating that God the Father has indeed given Jesus the authority to give life. But that there's more to it than that. Because Lazarus will die again at some point. And yet Jesus also says, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And that's not just an authoritative statement about Jesus giving life. It's also one concerning the final judgment. John records Jesus as earlier saying, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And do not be amazed by this, says Jesus, for the time is coming when all those who are in their graves will hear my voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. That's the confident hope that is celebrated on All Souls Day. And as we reflect on that, we can also gain perspective of how we can live in the present. Most importantly, the gospel is not merely an insurance policy that those who Paul says are in Christ will be resurrected at the last day into life in God's presence. The gospel is much more than being saved, if I can use that evangelical language. The gospel is the good news that Jesus is the Messiah and that Israel's story and the biblical canvas as a whole has been fulfilled in him. Messiah means, amongst other things, king. And in Jesus Christ, God established the kingdom or the reign of God. To claim Jesus as Messiah is to state that God is acting distinctly and decisively in Jesus. And as we have just heard, King Jesus has been given the right to give life and to judge. If you go back to the Adam and Eve story, God wanted them to rule the world as his image bearers. But they failed. And so in the fullness of time, God sent his son, Jesus the Messiah, to rule the world as the second Adam. God's action in raising Jesus from the dead reveals that he is now the world's rightful Lord. And he commissions the church to bear witness to the world of the Jesus story, the gospel, and to embody his kingdom as the people of God. That is our role until the day when God fully establishes his reign on earth. We need this bigger picture from the creation story to the final culmination of history at Christ's second advent so that we can appreciate the gospel in context. If we ignore that bigger biblical picture, then the gospel itself gets distorted. And that's what happens when we reduce the good news to simply hope of life after we die because we've been baptized as a child or said the believer's prayer at some point in our life. The story of Jesus is then about the Messiah's kingdom vision. This vision emerges out of the creation story, out of Israel's story of trying to live out God's desire for the chosen people, and out of John's vision of the city of God in the book of Revelation. The entire story of Jesus is the narrative of his birth, his life, and his teaching. 
his miracles and his actions, and not just his death, his burial, his resurrection, ascension, and exaltation. Inherent into the, in the gospel story of Jesus are labels that define him, that identify him, and his role in completing Israel's story. Titles such as Messiah, Lord, Son of God, Savior, and Son of Man. The story of Jesus as Messiah, as King, as Lord, results in what is yearning for completion in the story of Israel that we read about in the Old Testament. It is this story that the apostles preached, and it is this story that we proclaim today among this great cloud of faithful witnesses. Let us celebrate this heritage of the faithful in Christ. Let us remind ourselves that we are part of this great story and so regain perspective for daily life. And let us look forward to that great banquet while still being busy in the present doing kingdom work. For Christ's sake. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you proclaim that it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. May we better recognize Jesus as the risen and glorified King and help us better to see your big picture so that we may not lose our way and can live each day with greater confidence and hope. Gracious God, we pray for the families and friends of those who have died, particularly those who have died in the past year. While this is very personal for many, we acknowledge that on that list, most are names that we will never know, voices we have never heard, in places we may never visit, yet brothers and sisters all. And so we pray for those families of friends of those who died caught up in war and civil unrest, for migrants who died seeking a haven of safety, for victims of natural disasters, famines, and various infectious diseases. Give peace and comfort to all. Almighty God, we thank you for those who have gone before us, pioneers in faith and ministry, in thought, word and deed. We know that they were no more perfect than any of us, yet we thank you for their example and the good influence they have had on us. Creator God, at this critical time we pray for the COP climate talks and for the future of our planet home. We lament the damage that has been done but we come knowing that you are a God of mercy and miracles. We pray for world leaders as they meet in Glasgow, that they will do what is right and fair. May the common desire to protect the world enable good conversations, positive actions, and bring about unity. We pray for those joining them from countries on the front line of climate change, and who are experiencing the worst impacts and yet having contributed the least. May their voices carry weight and power, and we ask that you, God, would protect their place at the negotiating table. We pray for everyone's safety, for wisdom and resolve, and we acknowledge the responsibilities you have placed upon us as stewards of your creation. Merciful God, we also pray for all those who are in need of healing and comfort at this time. We pray especially for the men in the boarding house at McGregor, and for Graham, Roger, Shirley, Aggie and John, Angie and Stan, Kathleen and Maggie, Kathy Honor, Judy Pillen, Amy, and from Matthew's friend, Grady. 
And we pray for any who fear the uncertainties of the future. So let's pray for all these people and for other situations known to us in a moment of silence. Lord, hear our prayer. We give thanks of news that Grady's surgery on his hand has gone well. And we pray for your healing presence to be in his life and restore full function to his fingers. Where there is darkness, bring your light and perspective. Enfold us, Lord, in your peace and in the sure knowledge of your presence. Strengthen our hearts for the challenges we face. Help us to recognize that you are alongside us on our journeys and help us also to let go of our fears and to trust more fully and more deeply in you. Hear our prayers, God, for your church in this place and around the world. Sustain and support the work of the gospel in this and every place. Where the church is in physical danger, protect it with your spirit. Where the church is facing division, unify it through your love. Where the church lacks courage to stand up for justice, embolden it with the example of those who have gone before us. And where the church lacks energy and vision, renew its hope in the presence of Christ who is with us always. Hear all our prayers through your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who has taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand for our final hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith, and who now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.